What's up, Internet? John here from NextGen. Our guest today was once featured on CTV as a skilled luthier turned master of restoring vintage instruments. He still makes the odd top-tier instrument for select customers, but found his passion and notoriety as the go-to repair shop, not just in Ottawa, where his shop is located, but worldwide as customers from all corners ship Ian their guitars so that he can work his magic on them. In the early years, he traveled all the way to England to learn at the famed Totnes School of Guitar Making under the guidance of the great Phil Messer. Uh, he came back to a job at La Luthierie, I pr- forgive my horrible pronunciation, I'm not French, uh, in Montreal, where he worked with some of the best luthiers in Canada. Um, despite his reputation and vast experience, we're t- working on probably over 25,000 guitars at this point in 15 years. Ish. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't let that go to his head. He continues to educate himself, attending workshops and seminars with the best, the best of the best across the world, whether they be manufacturers or repair guys. And top that off, he's a big supporter of the Plex machine, even joining the Plex support and software development team, where he assists users across North America, including some of the largest guitar manufacturers in the world, frankly. Uh, so, Ian, welcome to Next Gen. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, take me back. If you, if you can, take me back to the beginning. You graduate high school in 2002, and then get a diploma in applied sciences, and then whew, you go to England to study guitar building. Yeah, well, it's, I'm from Quebec, so it was CJEP. So I finished uh, I finished my CJEP in 2004. Okay. And uh, at the end of CJEP, I was kind of burnt out with the whole science and academia and, you know, chasing the grades and competing against everyone else for the best grades and just filling your head with knowledge that you don't actually get to use yet. Mm. It's always in higher education. You just got to keep going until you actually get somewhere. And I just, I was antsy to get my hands on something and I was obsessed with the guitar. You know, Why had, guitar? Were you a guitar player? I was a guitar player. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I started off on the piano. Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah, so my first you know, as from young childhood, I was playing piano all the way up to about 13, 14 years old. And then when I figured out that Metallica on the piano didn't really work, <laughs> uh, my parents got me a guitar. And what got me obsessed with the guitar is that in all those years of piano, if ever something wasn't working right when I was trying to play a song, it was never the piano's fault. Piano always worked. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, well, I'm on, too. and now I'm on this new instrument, which happened to be a J. Terser Les Paul replica. Nice. <laughs> like, you know, it was a $300 guitar. Yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden, it's like, I'm trying to play this note, and this instrument will not play this note. And it's not me. It's, it's, it's not my fault. What's going on here? And, you know, back in the days in Montreal, you get a, another guitar, you, you bring it to someone to try and make it better. And typical music store experience, unfortunately, is that you leave poorer and with a worse guitar. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, by the age of, you know, 19, I was like, screw it. I'll figure it out for myself and started fiddling and cleaning up friends' guitars and just learning to clean fingerboards and oil stuff. Oh, while you're doing CJEP? Yeah, while well, I'm still doing CJEP. It's yeah. you know, just stuff. Is, I really liked it. Nice. And then at the end of CJEP, when they gave me the McGill book, it was like this thick. <laughs> and you go through it, and it's just, just nothing in there. That you're just nothing that you want to do. 19 years old, and you know, my parents encouraged me to follow this passion. Luckily, it was just the right point in a, any person's lifetime to... All right, let's, let's yeah, see. Like that's of any time to do it. That's the time. Yeah, so. That's the time. So <laughs> did that. Came back, got a job as a guitar repair man, and I am now officially not qualified to do anything else. <laughs> you mentioned before uh, that you love that though you loved building guitars, you found your passion restoring guitars while uh, while working in Montreal. Yeah, I was not so much just restoring, but repairing, enhancing, modifying. Um, because with building, it's a very linear process. You know, you can't you can't put frets in a guitar when the lumber's not even cut. Yeah, not happening. Um, I probably have some form of attention deficit disorder because <laughs> I can't I can't do linear like that all day long and you know just make an instrument from start to finish and finish it, make another instrument from start to finish. No, I need, I need to bounce all over the place, mm. and that's the great thing about guitar repair. You know, this morning I was uh, putting a new calfskin head on a 1920s banjo. Jeepers. Then I made a new nut and a fret dress on a 60s uh, Gibson Hummingbird. And uh, tomorrow I got to finish a uh, color touch-up and clear coat build-up on a rebind on another 60s Gibson. Wow. Along with, it's just, it's it's all over the place, all the time. You never (laughs) know what you're going to get. 
when you're so there's a difference. There's a connection too. There's a difference. Like emotionally, when you're building a guitar, it's like a process. You you, you don't like the linear thing where you start, you finish onto the next project kind of thing. But there's that great sense of sort of satisfaction when you finish building a guitar. Is the the sense is an odd question. I'm not sure how to word it, but like is this sort of that same sense of completion on the uh, in repairs and restoration the same way? Because I mean, there's got to be there must be some awesome feeling taking something that wasn't playable that should be and suddenly making it not only playable but often better than it was when it was new to me it's even more rewarding than building because when you're building a new instrument the instrument means nothing to the new owner he's placed his commission he's got an idea of what he's going to receive but Mm. there's no meaning in that guitar yet it eventually will carry meaning but when someone brings me, like I got one, uh, another, I think it's, it's 60s Gibson week. I got another 60s Gibson in um, <laughs> from a, a customer who inherited the guitar from his father. Wow. That's the most meaningful guitar he will ever own. Yeah. And while well, the bridge plate is screwed, the X brace is unglued, the top is belly, the frets are done. So it doesn't guitar so well anymore, <laughs> but it already means the world to him. And when I actually turn it back into a guitar, it's, it's going to be awesome. It's that much more. Yeah. yeah. That's all. You know, I never thought of it that way, actually. The, the, a new guitar doesn't really have the same kind of story or connection as something that's been brought back to life. Some people will, you know, they'll place a meaning on a new guitar. It'll be a reward for like a, a, a stepping stone they've passed in their life, like yeah. a first child born or a gre- high school graduation for a child or dad and the kid both get a guitar because, yeah. <laughs> you know, it'll, it'll be like a, a time stamp on it. Oh, well, as soon as my son's old enough, we're going to hit the shop and we're going to build one together. Here, who will yeah yeah and that'll be a very meaningful instrument when you finish because you made it together Mm. but yeah that's what i like about repair and restoration um by definition a luthier is someone who makes stringed instruments makes and repairs this is how i was gonna say yeah it seems you're a firm believer the two go hand in hand how would you how do you find education and experience doing either one sort of builds the other up very few people are excellent at both. Mm-hmm. Everybody is a little bit better at one than the other. And as the years go by, you become more and more badass. Like, <laughs> I think the, like, the, the top badass of the era right now is probably TJ Thompson. Mm. Uh, he, just, he just does pre-war Martins. It's all, he, it's all he does. But I just saw one of his posts the other day where he, uh, he refinished a uh, 31 or 32 uh, OM. And he Jeez. did uh, net, he did a, a burst on the OM or shade top as you would call on a on a Martin, and he relicked it. And I'm pretty hard to fool. I do this for a living. I couldn't tell. Wow. It's like I couldn't tell. It's like the checking is perfect. The playware is perfect. And that thing was in the white two weeks ago. Yeah. It's like how the hell did you do that, TJ? <laughs> <laughs> so so he's uh, he's top badass right now for me at least. I had the privilege of getting a tour at your shop. Um, unfortunately footage is not particularly useful, <laughs> but, uh, I had the footage of, of getting to your shop back in February and it's very, very much one of the better equipped shops and certainly the most, the most well-organized and clean shops that I've been to, um, of the handful of luthiers and builders and repair guys that I've met in person at their shops. But you didn't always start out at your shop where you are now. You've only been there for a couple of years. Yeah, it's been three years in this yeah. current shop. Uh, I, I dug way back and I found some really old pictures and your shop when you first moved to Ottawa was like, it looks like it was in like a, a bedroom. Yeah. And it was barely a bedroom. It was like a <laughs> large closet. <laughs> so I got to ask this question because like for all the other small shop owners, a lot of these, a lot of people, certainly our customers and presumably some listeners are people who are crammed in really small spaces. What, what are your like top? tips, secrets for keeping a small space well-organized and clean? Because certainly sanding a guitar in a closet. <laughs> can... um, unfortunately, good tools are not cheap. This uh, is true. But dust control. It's like you, you have to have dust collection. I've got one, two, three. I've got four Festool dust collectors in my shop. Festools are not cheap. <laughs> no, they're not. But uh, like when I got my Plex machine the first time, there's a, an auto start stop for a vacuum cleaner. Mm-hmm. And I bought a, uh, I bought a uh, shop vac at yep. the local hardware store. The first board plane we did was an aggressive board plane. It took off a lot of material and, and we did a very tight tool pass for a nice surface finish, meaning the machine was running for an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. Well, after 40 minutes, the shop vac 
kick the bucket. It was done. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but the festivals, I can, I can run a three hour process on the Plex machine and the machine never stops. Yeah. Yeah. Cheaper, cheaper vacuums. I've had this problem. I've gone through three shop vacs yeah. in, in my lifetime. The motors just aren't meant to go forever. No. And, yeah. and the, the, the festivals are quiet compared to a shop vac, which is nice. And, and it just goes on forever. Like if you hook it up, let's say you have a disc sander that uh, hooks up to a dust collector and you need to sand this entire table, just hook it up to the Festool. And if it takes the day, the Festool will work the day. Nice. Maybe I need to invest in a Festool. <laughs> It'll be the last dust collector you ever buy. Well, that's always nice. Yeah. Uh, and then maximizing small space. I feel like you need to start off in someone else's shop first to mm. realize what tools you are comfortable with and actually need. It's maybe shadow yeah. somebody else or work for them. Like it's, it's crazy the amount of stuff I can do with a uh, four by 32 belt sander. Mm. Like I can make a bridge on it. I can make a nut on it. I can make so much stuff on a four by 32 belt sander. Cause that's what I was kind of given at the repair shop in Montreal. First nut I made, it's like, well, do you have like feeler gauges, calipers? Like, oh, we don't have time for that. We got 30 others to do. Here's what, here's what you do. Grab, yeah. grab a bone blank. Go. <laughs> there you go. It fits. And of course, the first time you do that, well, you throw the first five bone blanks in the garbage because you yeah. ruined them. <laughs> but I do it every day now. So yeah, I can I fit a bone blank in, I don't know, two or three minutes. Bone blank is fit. Yeah. Um, so that's just, yeah, get in someone else's shop, see what tools you're comfortable with. And focus on the smaller ones too because uh yeah a six foot joiner is fantastic for making neck through guitars but you're not going to fit that in a closet <laughs> definitely not no, yeah not. no and uh just get good with hand tools because mm. you can you can make a really nice guitar with nothing but planes and chisels they don't take up much room that's, that's true it's high skill but low investment and uh it doesn't take up much room and they don't make dust those tools they're cutting tools yeah, which is very nice. Yeah, you just sweep up and throw it in the trash. Yeah. You mentioned the Plex machine. Uh, that was kind of the, the highlight of the shop for me when, when you showed me around. Uh, well, to talk about it for a bit. For people who don't know or have never heard of a Plex machine, right, right from the get-go, what is it? Uh, my spiel is the Plex machine is a machine for mapping out, uh, mapping out a guitar, leveling fingerboards, slotting fingerboards, cutting fingerboards for inlay, leveling the fingerboards, cutting nut pockets, cutting nuts, slotting bridges, locating bridge pin holes, and leveling frets within plus or minus two to four ten thousandths of an inch. That sounds like a really well-versed paragraph. <laughs> I get the question a lot. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but it, yeah, this is no, you know, this is not just another belt sander or or some other kind of tool. This is a like a high-end contr computer-controlled, very, very precise machine. Yes. Well, uh, as precise as the programmer. <laughs> the word tool is still important. It is still a tool. Yeah. I, try, I always stress with new people who, uh, who want to say the word, oh, the machine automatic, nope. There's automatic nothing. <laughs> yeah. Does your does your table saw automatically cut your wood for you? No, it automatically nothings. It it just does what you tell it to do. Mm. It will do very terrible work with extreme precision if that's what you want. <laughs> if that's what you program into it. If right? that's what you program into it. Um, but no, the reason I got the Plex machine was uh, I got to a point in my second shop, the one you probably saw in far, farther in the Facebook feed, which was <laughs> the basement of my house. Yeah. Um, I got to a point where you know I had a three month waiting list for r guitar repair. It's like you know I'm not I'm not just this god builder making these wonderful pieces of art. I'm I'm a maintenance guy. Yeah. And having a three month waiting list and just having to work like seventy plus hours a week to get through the volume, I needed a way to get more work done and either maintain or increase the level of quality. Mm -hmm. And search and search and search, try hiring people, try getting some help. And in the It's end, hard to find good people. And tell me about it. Yeah. Um, but in the end it was I need a robot. And uh that was the best investment I ever made was that robot. Mm. Because uh it's not only the precision, but the consistency and the repeatability. Say a customer, it happens all the time. A customer comes back after three years with a new guitar. He's like, hey, you guys did a great job on my strat three years ago. Can you do the same thing to this new telly I just bought? And we can just say yes. Yes. Identical yeah. down to plus or minus two ten thousandths of an inch. Two ten Ten thousandths of an inch. Yeah, that's one fiftieth the diameter of your high E string on your electric guitar. Yeah, that's pretty precise. Yeah, most even most CNCs that are building guitars are only one thousandth of an inch or half a thousandth of an inch. 
It depends so, how you set the machines, but yeah, yeah you will. Uh, you look at Taylor uses Fidals, a lot of Fidals, and those machines will hold a ten thou, no problem. Oh. It's but they are tools. You you can make a Fidal <laughs> you can, guitar too. Yep. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's 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 just being able to offer that. You know, there's no more guesswork. There's no more yeah. promising that you'll try to do your best, but you know it's Friday and it's the last one, and you just got to knock it out to get to the weekend. So there is no Friday guitar. Yeah, it's it's good. It's and it's like you said, repeatable. If I bring you my guitar today, and then I bring you a different one five years from now, say I want it set up the same, it'll be no problem within two ten thousandths of an inch. Of course, the same. we keep the records. Yeah, it's like I've got the record of your previous guitar. I don't even need to remember. Hmm. It's like I can even give you advice. Go well. The last guitar you brought me had really tall frets, around fifty thou. You just brought me a guitar around with frets around thirty thou, so I can technically meet the numbers, but it's going to feel really, really different. Mm. I'm talking about a guitar I saw three years ago. Yeah, there's no way you can just quick reference that in your mind as a shop that doesn't have that, unless he brings you both guitars. Yeah, exactly. Which and it does not happen. It does not yeah. happen. So yeah, it just uh, it brings a level of uh, kind of uh, clinical precision to the whole experience. I, I love stuff like that. I love advances in technology in the guitar industry. Um, how long has Plek been around? Mid nineties. Really, that long? Yeah. I had only I had only heard of it myself. Um, I want to say five or six years ago. And it was I was I was considering what I was doing. I was thinking of building cabs. I was thinking of doing guitar repairs. I, I just I knew I wanted to do something in the industry because I had been kind of working in it for ever and figured I'd do something on my own instead of working for somebody else. And uh, I ended up with this. <laughs> but uh, one of the things I was looking at was potentially a shop, and I saw I was researching tools and equipment to buy because I'm a big believer also that if you're going to do something, go all the way and try and do it well. And uh, the, the Plex machine seemed like it would be a really good investment for a repair shop. Maybe not right away. <laughs> but, you got to work up to it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it was something I was looking at, and I remember seeing it and thinking, "This is this is really ingenious." I hope this catches on. I didn't know it was already around for twenty years at that point. The first Plex machine in North America was sold to Joe Glazer in two thousand and one. Wow! It was the Plex Basic, which was a dinosaur compared to what I have. Yeah, it would take about two hours to do a fret dress on that thing. <laughs> uh, but that was the first machine sold in North America in two thousand and one. Wow! And then I think in two thousand and seven, the first Plex Pro came around. The Plex Pro is kind of the big brother of what I have, the Plex Station, which is geared more toward production. Uh, yeah, so like a place like PRS or somebody would have. That. And Gibson basically has Plex Gibson, Pros. Yeah. Uh, the reason for the Plex Pro, uh, the difference between the Plex Pro and the Plex Station is mainly the automatic tool changer. So the high frequency spindle, I have to change the tools manually, mm. and then it recalibrates itself automatically. Whereas the Plex Pro has a rack of tools at the top and it just goes and fetches the tools like the fancy for those. Uh, okay, yeah. And it also has um, a pneumatic uh, string tension simulation system. Okay. So you see when I work, I use with real strings and I scan with strings on. Truss rod adjustments, scan again, then take the strings off, strap it in, cut it, strap it in, and retune it, measure it again. So it's slightly slower than the Plex Pro because... Yeah, but you're also not trying to crank out 100 guitars a day. No, but let's say the Plex Pro, like Gibson, Montana, they have like four sets of jigs that go on the guitars. There's a jig that goes on the bridge, jig the jig that goes on the headstock. You feed it in the door, the pneumatic press grabs it and makes the actual string tension but pneumatically yep. and then the machine goes to work so there's a lot less scanning involved because mm -hmm. we're not measuring where the strings are we're not uh, starting scans over and over again uh, so it just it speeds stuff up mm -hmm. like on the plex station a fret dress from start to finish will take about 20 minutes that's just a fret dress there's no setup yeah, in there there's no polishing or, yeah. that's just machine time whereas on the plex pro they've got it down to like eight about eight minutes. Okay. So like half and, the time. Yeah. If you've got a shop, let's say you're where you were five years ago when you were in, in your basement um, and you're wanting to really step up your game. At what point do you think it's worth it for a repair, like a full-time repair shop to look into something like a Plex machine? It really depends on uh, your level of commitment to the craft. Hmm. Because uh, the unfortunate reality is that most people that go into this business don't make it from my personal, just from my personal stats and having been doing this for 15 years and talking to, you know, uh, people who own guitar making schools, people who have had work workshops and people spin off, start their own workshop. The survival rate's 1%. Mm. 
So wow. are you that committed? That's uh, incredibly low. It's incredibly low. And that's why it's so hard to find people. Um, and we can talk about that later. But basically, if you are really committed, you are now established. Let's say you've been running your own shop for five years mm -hmm. and you want to go to the next level. You've already got everything else because, you know, don't get a plaque machine before you get a drill press. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one's a little more important more frequently than the other yeah exactly yeah. Um, but if your, your shop is decked out and you've got the volume and you just can't deal with it and you just need that so a plec makes a great first employee when you need that's exactly what to it was step it by yeah my plec like machi my plec machine's name is Christopher <laughs> and he was my first employee that's awesome well, Chris <laughs> good job yeah. And, um, but there are also, you know, multi-man shops that buy plec machines for the first time. Now there's, uh, the guitar guys that just got one in Ohio. It's a couple, you know, a three man shop mm -hmm. and still they just needed to get that volume and consistency. Yeah. Up. So yeah. Cause it isn't just about tapering. It isn't just about taking care of the volume you're handling. It's as you said, accuracy and consistency, mm -hmm. which a fresh job on a Friday night when you're trying to get out the door. Which in the end just makes the business grow. It's uh, it's a little, it's not overnight, but if you are if you're a small shop with reasonable overhead and you take on this either as a, you know a, a loan or half of a loan or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, even with medium volume, you know if you're doing twenty guitars a month, you can afford it. Wow, that's 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 a lot lower than I thought it would be actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, it's not printing money for you. No, it's, it's, and that's <laughs> you not, still have to do the work. You have to not, learn the software. You have to learn how to adjust the programming based on what's scanning. And that's not scanning. the point of the machine either. Yeah, it's uh, it is very much a tool. It's not put guitar in machine, give me money, better guitar come out. That's not how it works. You know, it's funny you mention it like that. Uh, I've I've known some luthiers, guitar builders, not not as much experienced guys, but guys that are just getting into it and built their first couple of guitars and they can't wait to get a CNC machine to make everything so much easier and faster. And it doesn't work like that. <laughs> no, no. I mean, as a matter of fact, if you're an electric builder, you can, you can go a long way and a long time with a pin router. That's yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. You can hire someone to CNC some good templates yeah. and learn to use a pin router. Cause yeah, CNC, you need to be making like 50, 60 guitars a month to, justify that kind of CNC. expense yeah not just expense but you know you're going to invest in the software you're going to invest your own time in learning how to use this tool and programming it accurately because that's one thing with a plec machine i don't know cad or cam mm -hmm. it's not something i need to learn we have a graphic user interface it's built like a video game i take my experience and the video game lets me apply it yeah nice whereas if you're buying a cnc machine you you're you found a big rabbit hole Big one. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. I looked into it actually for building cabs and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a massive rabbit hole. Yeah. And then there's the mistakes along the way, the wrong software, the wrong machine. I mean, I've heard horror stories from even very well-known builders who survived and moved on to something else, but very expensive mistakes of buying the wrong machine, the wrong software, the, mm. the, wrong, the wrong power. It, you can that screw hurts, yourself man. solidly. That hurts, man. And you need to make a lot of guitars. I, um, you were, me were mentioning how it's, it's tough to find good people, um, for a lot of reasons, but, but before we get to that, how did you, you obviously were a good person because you ended up working at, La, I can't pronounce La this. La Lutri MF. La Lutri MF. Is that there good? You go. All right. Sweet. <laughs> uh, nailed it. Um, how, what, what would you say makes a good employee? to come into a repair shop? The best guy I found, which he's still with me right now because of this whole COVID madness, he's not in the shop, but he will be back, Spencer. Awesome. He's the best I've found. And he has two things that turns out is what made him very good at this. First of all, serious ADD. <laughs> it's like ADD is a very good thing. <laughs> it's, it's not what people want it to be. It's, it's a talent. Mm. And he had most of his work experience in a commercial kitchen. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Where, you know, you've got 40 tables. Yeah, you've got to get the, the job done. You've got to get it done right. Get it out now. It's not about your ego. It's not about, it, it, it's just get her done. Yep. And because my shop is such high volume, 
we go through about, you know, between 80 and 90 guitars a month, which means two visits per customer, one in, one out. So that's yeah. 180 visits. And then we got to get the work done. So it's, it's a busy place. Yeah. And you have to be able to, you know, start something on the Plex machine, tell it to go deal with a customer while the Plex machine's still running and you've dealt with a customer. Well, you're not going to twiddle your thumbs. You got to work on something else. Yeah. And having, having the ADD and coming from the commercial kitchen to him, it was normal. Mm. Most people get completely and totally overwhelmed. Yeah. I can, I can imagine. Cause you walk in and you, there's always that deer in the headlights kind of thing where the moment they stop uh, one job, they're like, what am I, what do I do now? There's a hundred jobs around them, but they just don't know that they need to go and do, do it. Yeah. Yeah. They need to, too much direction often. Too much direction. And it's also, it's a high experience game repair. Mm. Very high experience. Uh, you got to know what's the difference between a Floyd Rose 2 and a Floyd Rose Pro. Mm. It's like, well, the Floyd Rose Pro didn't have the little steel inserts in the base plate, so they strip all the time. So that's why that one's broken and you can't fix it without changing the base plate. Yeah. Floyd Rose 2, that's got the steel inserts. We can send it to the machine shop. They can helicoil that guy and you can fix it. <laughs> but how do you know that? Well, it just, it happened to me five times. So now it's in my head. And so I know it. Now you know it. Yeah. And this is the kind of experience that it's pretty hard to put in a textbook and teach a new employee. Yeah, it's that's you, the way I learned is the way I'm trying to learn to teach the next generation is uh, I was in a shop and had my ass saved every day by five guys that had 20 years experience. So it so is that so is that maybe the best way to go? Let's say if you're a let's say you're working your shop out of your house, you've got your little closet filled with tools. Uh, and you're and you just invested in your festival dust collection. Um, let's say you want to get out of your closet. You want to get into a proper shop. You want to start doing this full time. You were mentioning earlier that it's a really good idea to go try and work for somebody else for a while. Um, yeah, the music store, even no, the music stores are really at the bottom of the ladder. But you yeah, have to that's start my somewhere. experience too. Yeah, you really have to start somewhere. If you are passionate, if you are smart, and if you are driven, a music mm-hmm. store is fine. The great thing about a music store is the amount of guitars you get to see. You know, a Gibson, a Taylor, and a Martin are built completely differently. And if you're in the boondocks in a closet, you might see one of each in a year. Yeah, if you're lucky. If you work at Long and McQuaid, you're going to see one of each before lunch. Yeah. And you're just going to get used to this, and you're going to recognize stuff that soon your eyes will get trained to see things you're not even thinking about. Mm. Like, I can tell Nitro from across the room. Yeah. So yeah, look at a Taylor, you look at a, at, a, at a Gibson from across the room. For some reason, I can tell which is polyester, which is nitro. Yeah, most people wouldn't. That's no, most sure. people wouldn't, yeah. but I stare at them all day. And that's just from the practice. You learn to see what to look for. So it's, uh, yeah, start starting a music store. If there is a repair shop hiring, try that. But uh, even try sales in a music store. Just you have to get the experience. Be around of, guitars more yeah. than your guitars and your buddy's guitars yeah because um, if you're going to be in repair you got to know all of them is it worth because you started out going to guitar building school is it worth doing that and then going into repairs yes yeah 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 the uh, i think guitar making you have to at least make one or two to get good at guitar repair just you have to learn how to design a guitar mm. you have to learn how to draw a guitar on a blueprint the first the first few jobs I got in Ottawa were guys with acoustic guitars that had brought their guitars to every other shop. And they're like, I brought it everywhere. The guitar plays in tune from frets eight and up, but it plays flat or it plays sharp as I move towards the first positions. Well, if you've made a guitar from scratch and if you've drawn a guitar from scratch, you're like, yeah, nuts in the wrong spot. And then you do your math, you set your calipers and see where this nut's supposed to Oh, yeah, well, your nut is too far forward by 15 thou, or it's too far back by 20 thou. No wonder it sounds like shit. Yeah. And that was like the first month I was working in Ottawa. I got like five of those. Mm. Wow. And because I made guitars and I made blueprints, I'm like, well, if the bridge is in the right spot and the frets are in the right spot, then there's only one thing left that's in the wrong spot. Yep. It's the nut. And you probably wouldn't think of that necessarily. I mean, you, you would think maybe, oh, maybe I need to file the nut down, but you wouldn't think necessarily of repositioning the nut. You just kind of assume factory made, probably CNC guitar. It should be in the right place, right? Yeah. But isn't necessarily always. You know what assume does? Yeah, well, yeah of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of, I started out, uh, sadly, working in the one of the kinds of music stores 
where the owner, the, the goal was always to make money. Didn't matter how. And it, it was a, it was a terrible experience in a lot of ways, but it was a great experience because it taught me a lot about the kind of business owner I didn't want to be when I grew up and the kind of job I wouldn't want to do. Um, and I, I, I just remember every guitar that came in, no matter what it was, no matter what its problem was, the owner would say, oh, yeah, John could take care of that. John could fix that. And I saw, like, it was every job, virtually every job was way over my head. So I was forced to learn a lot very quickly and work very hard to do the job right. And I guarantee you 90% of them weren't done as well as, like, they certainly weren't done to my satisfaction. Customers mostly seemed happy, which luckily the kinds of customers who bring their stores to this kind, the bring their guitars to this kind of music store don't have super high expectations for repair. But um, I, I, uh, I remember, I, I probably, you've seen horror stories of like really badly botched guitars you see them all on, you know, on memes online, on the internet all the time. Have you ever had people bring you, I'm sure you have, had, what's the worst like botched repair job you've ever had show up in your shop? Like I took it somewhere else and this is what they did to it. Can you fix it? Uh, it was a, unfortunately, a 50s Gibson Southern Jumbo. Oh my word. And someone had repaired a, repaired a broken headstock with epoxy and drywall screws. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I was never that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like guitar fail on Instagram. That I, I had one of those. That was a that was a guitar fail. So what are some like crazy shop triumphs you've had? I mean, being doing restores repairs. I'm sure you've had some instruments come in that are in such a way that you know you take it to most repair shops and they go, "Yeah, I can't fix this." <laughs> What's like the worst thing that doesn't even resemble a guitar anymore that you turn back into a well playable instrument? Uh, that bass that was in a house fire. Oh, uh, that was in the CTP video. Yeah, no, yeah. that was no, that was no, that was a that was a Telecaster custom. Yes. Anyway, yeah. Uh, Sorry. No, that okay, was an, that was another one. But the one I didn't I show you that one when you came to the show. You did. Yeah, yeah. that was just a few months ago. Yeah. So that uh, that was a sad story, but that was something that showed up and like half of the br- the base was crumbling. It was now charcoal. It was carbon, mm. and turned it into an instrument. Kept the vibe of the fire on it. That's special to me. Yeah, that's a, that's a meaningful bass. Okay, yeah, very sad story, but it's a, it's a meaningful bass. If not in in my earlier years, I I would take on a lot of those terrible, terrible things, uh, just to try and prove to myself and to the world that it could be done. Mm. Uh, I bet you I, learn a lot taking on those kind of jobs too. You do, and but after a while, uh, you realize that. They are a learning experience, but they are not a profitable enterprise. Yeah, because you spend more time learning to do it right. Yeah. And unfortunately, when you build a shop like I've built in a commercial spot with a plaque machine and with employees, you can't do things just to show off. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You, you really have to, you do have to think of your operating expenses. You bought <laughs> yeah, the, the, there's the reality, the economics. No, I'm not in this business just to make money because, because uh, uh, spoiler alert, if you're going into guitar repair, <laughs> it's not to make money. You can make money, but for the hours invested, there are more lucrative uh, avenues in life. Certainly, yeah. Um, I'd say the same about owning a parts distributor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, so I don't do it solely for the purpose of making money or else I'd do something else. Uh, but reality is overhead yeah employees like getting paid have you ever had any shop failures let's say and I, I'm, I'm sure people who build guitars and who fix guitars don't want to talk about jobs that didn't work out but did you ever have a repair that came in that you're like yes i can do this you put x amount of hours into it and you just discover over maybe other things come up as you're trying to work on it that it's just not going to be it's just not going to happen certainly not for a, a price that's worth getting it repaired for it's happened twice and on the same type, it's always a, a similar story. The first time it was someone made themselves a kit guitar from a Martin kit, and they missed. Mm. So he asked me to do a neck reset, which I attempted, but there was too much wood missing in the places where it shouldn't be missing. Yeah. Uh, so in the end... Not so bad in an electric. No, no but I haven't had catastrophic failures on ele- electrics. And the other one was... Repairing a overhaul that needed an overhaul. Um, you know, when uh, you're trying to get the neck off of a guitar, 
usually you steam the neck off, loosen the, the tongue of the fingerboard and you steam off the neck on a Martin. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, but the last person somehow had made sure that the top was loose from the sides, the back was loose from the sides, the, the head block was loose from the sides and the top and the back. So everything that you usually get to hang on to to get this neck out is flopping around. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was like, I'm trying, buddy. I'm really trying, but it's, it's uh, some, somebody really messed this one up. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, guitars aren't like violins. They're not designed to be deconstructed. Hmm. You know, when you've got herringbone purfling with plastic binding on the top and the back, which is hiding the kerf lining that glues the top or the back to the sides, it's just not something meant to be disassembled. Yeah. And so, yes, I could technically disassemble the guitar and reassemble the guitar but back to the reality of overhead yeah i would have to time. charge you so much money you <laughs> it's new guitar time yeah <laughs> unless this is one of those unbelievable attachment guitars that you just need to fix that no matter the cost yeah well sometimes people say that money is no object but and then you uh, quote them a price oh i've seen this a lot of times yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's a, a phrase that likes to get thrown around you, we've we've talked before, and you mentioned sort of your passion for building the industry more. Like you want to provide, like if you ever were involved in providing content of any kind, you would want to be teaching something. Yeah, I don't want to be teaching one on one or one on two in my shop, but doing something other than like, for your employees. <laughs> yeah, the, the, for my employees, which that, that's just it's a lifetime experience. Yeah, but doing something like this, you know, you pick a subject. Let's talk about this. You know, let's talk about. You know, finish repairs on Polly today. Mm. So what's next for you? Do you want to do like seminars or are you, have you ever thought about getting out of the shop and uh, doing that kind of educational stuff? The problem is just finding an audience mm. that can actually... That takes a lot of work, yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's an nice. audience that can actually benefit from the information that I can give out. Because I'm sure there's a lot of my customers that would be thrilled at the idea that they can have a seminar and they'll be asleep in like 15 minutes. Yeah. But, well, I'm, I kind of wonder then. Maybe we should hook up a little more because... I mean, you know, a large percentage of our customers are running repair shops or are luthiers and would certainly benefit, uh, I, I hope, from uh, quite a bit of the knowledge that you've earned through the years of the stuff that you've done. So It would be great if I could help the world uh, create less repairs that I have to repair. <laughs> <laughs> you want to put yourself out of a job. <laughs> no, they make, I think the, my estimate for annual guitar production is like 10 million guitars a year. Okay. So I think you're set. Yeah, we're fine. <laughs> like I can't keep up. And if we make five of me, we still won't keep up. So I'm not worried about it. There's, there's, there's enough work for everybody. Fair enough. What's your favorite aspect of your job doing repair stuff? The problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. There's just, there's no routine. And that's what I like. Yeah, every day it's a new problem. Yeah, sometimes it, sometimes it does burn me out. But, you know, when there's, there's some weeks where I end up going through runs for two weeks, all we're doing is fret dresses and setups. Yeah. It's like, all right, it's great. Rent's paid. <laughs> um, let's, can, can we do something fun now? <laughs> you, uh, now, naturally, and, and I experienced this myself, being just being in the industry, you end up enjoying... Outside of work, I, I still love a lot of what I do, and I, and I enjoy a lot of what I do, but I find uh, when I'm done the day, I don't necessarily want to talk guitars or do that kind of stuff anymore. Even though I love the stuff, it just you know it becomes a lot by the end of the day. Uh, so if you're not, I assume the same is true for you. Yes. So at the end, so at the end of the day, then what do you? Uh, where music used to be the hobby, it's now your 60 to 80 hour a week career. What are you doing outside of that? Uh, in the summer, motorcycle. Really? Yeah. Nice. What do you ride? Uh, Suzuki GSX-S 750. Okay. Yeah. A little uh, axe murderer with a headlight. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, man. Yeah. That's, that's one of my hobbies. Nice. Uh, do you go riding? Do you get out much? Uh, last year, I got out a lot. This year, I haven't really gotten out much, but I'm... Right now, I'm in the process of trying to just get most of the stuff in the shop done, not taking on just take a little time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll get some more riding done. Nice. Yeah, it's been pretty brutal this week. You certainly wouldn't want to have been riding. But <laughs> yeah, it was uh, hot as balls. I, I, I have been staring aimlessly at motorcycles online for a long time, saying to myself, someday 
I'd love to do that. I think at this point, now that I've got kids, I'll probably just have to wait until they're older and give it to myself as a move, as a when they move out present. But ah, dirt bike with the kids. Hey, that's a good idea. There's yeah. actually there's some dirt bike. Uh, there's some dirt biking not too far from where I live too. Yeah. So yeah, with with the kids, you should see on the internet what these little four and five year olds are doing on their little forty nine cc things. It's it's terrifying, but they're fearless. <laughs> Brutal. Well, I have to get my son to be comfortable sitting on a bike with training wheels still. <laughs> so a couple of years yet, maybe. But uh, all right. Uh, I'm a bit of a nerd and I love nerdy things like inside the actor's studio. I don't know if you've ever heard of or yeah. seen that show. Okay. So I created this sort of bastardized version of the Proust questionnaire uh, that's geared towards our industry. So if you'll indulge me, I'll ask a string of questions. Just give me the first answers to pop to your head. Okay. What is your favorite piece of gear? Fender Stratocaster. Fender Strat. All right. Classic. Singles? Noiseless singles or like the old? It depends on the day. That makes sense. Depends on the amount of gain too. Yeah. <laughs> What's your least favorite piece of gear? Something good. The five-string banjo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any particular reason? I have a very complex relationship with the banjo. Um... <laughs> I just can't stand how they sound. I am <laughs> annoyingly competent at fixing them. <laughs> but no matter how many hours you put into them, when you're done, it still sounds like a banjo. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this question has already been answered, but what, what sound or noise do you love? High gain rhythm guitar. Oh, nice. Yeah, you did mention Metallica earlier. Yeah, that was from my youth. Now they, they, they have much better noises nowadays. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> what, you, I think I know the answer to this already. What sound or noise do you hate? Banjo. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what inspires you to create? Whether you're creating music or whether you're, because um, I know you've built some guitars. What, what, what inspires you to make stuff of any kind? I just hate boredom. Mm. <laughs> just, if you're bored, you're like, I need to do something. Yeah, do something. What crushes your inspiration? Early sunsets, November. Oh. I hate November. You wouldn't think. Yeah, that's, that's a really well thought out answer. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the time of year where... Yeah, when the days just your get customers, so short. If you, th- if, you th- if, if you thought Ian was a particular dick, <laughs> look, at the, look at the calendar. It was probably November. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's nothing worse than showing up in the morning and it's pitch black out. And then you leave at the end of the day. And it's pitch black out. Uh, it, it crushes my soul. Yeah, I hear that. You're probably doing it already, but if you could have your dream job in the music industry, let's say it wasn't, if it wasn't what you're doing now, what would it be? No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Not a lot of people could say that, man. That's no. really cool. If I've got to stick to the music industry, no, I'm good. Okay, well, um, if you couldn't have a job, a music-related job, and you had to work elsewhere... What kind of job do you think you'd be doing? Probably something in the machining sector. Hmm. That makes sense. Just I can get obsessed about a thousandth of an inch. I'm good at it and I enjoy it. So. Which is a very handy <laughs> yeah. obsession to have in your career line. Uh, lastly, where does tone come from? The meat of the hand. So like a guy with big hands? <laughs> no, tone is in the meat of the hand. It's It's... The human. Yeah, the player. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's where the tone comes from. Uh, you'll hear stories time and time again about one bassist trying Jacko's doom bass could not sound like Jacko or um, yeah. what's his name? Cat Scratch Fever guy. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, him <laughs> trying somebody else's... Ted Nugent. Gu- Ted Nugent. Yeah. Trying somebody else's guitar still sounds like Ted Nugent. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's the guitarist. That, that's where the tone comes from. Nice. All right. Any, anything else you'd like to add? No, we should do this again. Talk about uh, maybe a focused subject. I would, I, I, I would like that actually. How? What kind of stuff would you want to talk about if we did this again? If it be educational, I'd like to talk about you know, the kind of jobs you're going to get regularly in your shop. Let's talk about it now. Okay. Yeah, do it. Uh, okay, what you're going to get regularly? Okay, let's still talk about setups later. That's just boring. <laughs> And that's uh, something everyone can do at home. <laughs> sure. Stop. 
<laughs> well, basic setups, at least. Basic, yeah. Um, uh, acoustic repairs. Um, in the uh, import guitar section, uh, I've, they've been corrected in many factories, but there is still this annoying um, habit by some manufacturers of super gluing the acoustic guitar bridge to the finish of the guitar. Instead of having the bare wood there? Instead of removing the finish and gluing the wood to the wood. Uh, the reason they do this is because they use either a UV cured finish or a polyurethane finish, meaning that they can clean up the crazy glue with acetone and mm -hmm. it looks super crisp and clean and the skill level involved is like nothing. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot less time to build too. It takes a lot less time and it looks looks professional at the door. Uh, and the crazy glue and the finish, they get to, they get along great. Like they really stick together. Yeah. It's the finish and the wood. They, they don't hold on so well. Yeah. So you're going to see a lot of, I guess I can't name name brands without getting sued. Um, <laughs> yeah. You'll see a lot of foreign made guitars. Uh, made in a country where the weather is great and the food even better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and has these kind of finishes, you're going to see bridge lifts a lot, mm. a lot of bridge lifts. And you have to get very comfortable at removing these bridges, removing the finishes and gluing them back on. My favorite way of doing this is before I remove the bridge, I will uh, clamp it down. So strings off, saddle off, bridge pins off, put the clamp down, get it fitting to the top. And then I'll score around the bridge with a very fresh, sharp X-Acto blade. And you go from a corner in, from a corner in, from a corner in. Oh, interesting. Curb, so that you never go past the corner and scratch the top of the guitar. That's smart, Max. That's a smart yeah. move, actually. Yeah. Um, because th th these repairs, like the concepts I'm going to throw out, very simple. The concepts are super simple. The room for failure is you've got none. Yeah. I, I, I feel like the more I... The more I get involved in this industry and talk to people who build things or repair things, that is a very common theme. Yeah. The concepts of doing stuff are actually really simple. Yeah. You just, you just, you don't have two chances. You only yeah. have one. So that's why corner in, corner in. And then with years, you'll end from taking these bridges off. You'll get a sense of how much to cut because your eyes will adjust and you'll be able to tell how thick the finish is. That mm. uh, your eyes getting practice. And you'll see some that are horrendously thick, like 20 thousands of finish. Jeez. Um, I won't name a brand, but they happen to have a uh, black back, which is not made of wood. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> and the finish on those guitars is horrendously thick. And mm. tr you're basically inlaying the bridge into the finish. That's what you're doing. Yeah. And cutting it and removing it is extremely tricky. And to remove it once I've scored, so let's pretend it's not the guitar with the black back, say one just with the crazy glue bridge and a normal thickness finish. Once I've gotten down to the wood, uh, what I like to do to remove the finish is I use a paring chisel. A paring chisel is a chisel that's about that long. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> why? Because I can be flush with the top of the guitar with the tip of my chisel and the handle is off the body. Oh yeah, of course, that's brilliant. And wear magnifying glasses, wear eye protection because, or don't and learn why. <laughs> And very, very carefully remove that finish and keep your eyes open. That line that you scored, keep a light reflecting on it and make sure that the other side of the line where you don't want to remove that finish, there's never a distortion in the light. As you're moving that tool and clicking off finish, if you see that portion of finish lifting or bubbling, that means that you didn't score deep enough. And if you keep pushing with your chisel. So pull back right away. You pull yeah. back, score again. And then try again. It's going to take you the first time. It'll take you three hours. Uh, yeah, no doubt. It takes me about 20 minutes now. But I've done it maybe seven or 800 times. Yeah. And then once that's done, you've got to clean off the bottom of the bridge. If the guitar still has a flat top, you can just belt sand the bridge. If the guitar does not have a flat top, an extreme belly or something like that, go in with a uh, scraper and gently scrape away the finish and, uh, and glue. And then you're ready for your dry run. Wow. This is, I feel like this is something 
I either need to get you in here to film you doing this to explain this kind of stuff, or uh, we should we should we should hook up again because this would be really. I think this is really cool stuff. I, I can definitely follow you right now, but I feel like if we if we if we're doing this more for for people to learn about it, it would be awesome to film it. So, would you be up for that? I'm good. I know you're super busy though. When are we going to make time for that? Or would it be in an evening like this or something like that? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Good. (laughs) That makes sense. Yeah. No. That's awesome. I. 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 uh, I I had seen um, a lot of guitar builders who they 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 have that perfect section where the bridge. I remember uh, Greenfield has a documentary online Mm -hmm. where he describes. He even has a section of the edge of the bridge that's just you know eighth inch in that's a few thousandths of an inch higher than the rest of the bridge because it sits in and that part sits on the finish and the wood part yep. sits right Taylor on the does wood. the same thing as well. Which, yeah. And that's great when you're manufacturing and you have access to high value tools like Michael Greenfield uses a CNC and Taylor uses thousands of CNCs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and for manufacturing, that's great. The problem with repair is that you're never going to run into the same bridge shape twice in the same week. Yes. And you're not going to jig up to and then try to measure this finish. Like, how thick is this finish? Is it 22 thou? Is it 23 thou? Because if you're off by 2 thou, well, you go from having no gap to having a gap. Have you ever, uh, you mentioned using CA glue. Um, have you ever have you ever used that? On, have you ever seen that used in a guitar on a finish? I only bring this up because uh, I'm, I'm a really big uh, pool billiards guy. And uh, a lot of billiard cues, actually, uh, custom cues, especially from high, some high-end builders, are finished with CA glue, actually. Yeah. That's that's polished and every and uh, everything at the end. I've I've never seen a CA finish on a guitar though. Is that even feasible? Because uh, those are like invincible. They are invincible. A lot of people are using it as a grain filler. Interesting. Yeah. I never. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and uh, people who are finishing, it depends on what your finishing solution is. Uh, the great thing about lacquer or nitro is that it will stick to anything yeah the downside of lacquer is that if you don't wait five weeks it'll be shiny for two days and then it won't be shiny anymore um but it'll stick to anything so i actually did a crack repair on a circa guitar a couple weeks ago it was a horrendous crack on a five-figure guitar spoke to the builder he he tells you what lacquer he uses for the top coat and he he grain fills with crazy glue Hmm. and Knowing what the finishing solution was, I was able to do the repair, and it's completely invisible. Yeah, but yes, nice. a lot of people are using it for uh, grain filling on backs and sides. Interesting on acoustics. On acoustics, yeah. when they're not using epoxy for yeah. grain filling. Interesting. Wow. And uh, what are your thoughts on? Uh, I know some builders too. Certainly, with regard to necks, uh, including the fingerboards on necks, I've seen I've seen people mention. You know, you spend all. Uh, not using water, yeah, so water-based that's, that's adhesives. Mr. Greenfield as well. He, yeah, that's one from him yeah. as well. But I, I've heard it also on uh, on basically uh, uh, almost anywhere on the guitar. After the major portions are glued in, you don't you want to use water-based adhesive because water is going to make the wood wood move theoretically. And also, water-based adhesives fail at a lower point than a good marine grade epoxy, like an RBC epoxy. Mm. Now, if an RBC epoxy, if you don't get it to like 175 Fahrenheit, it'll hold. Is there any, now presumably the kinds of guitars that are getting built this way aren't going to need the same kind of repairs, but is there any greater difficulty repairing a guitar that's been assembled that way? Uh, if I have to replace the fingerboard, yeah, I have to get it a lot hotter. Mm. And let's say you're trying to remove an ebony fingerboard from a maple neck with that amount of heat, maple scorches really easily. So you have to either plane it off, which will increase the time consumption by quite a bit, yeah. uh, or you run the risk of scorching it when you are removing it with heat. I'm seeing roasted roasted maple, roasted ash, roasted alder, roasted woods, torrified woods yeah. being used more and more frequently in guitar making these days. Um, but almost always in electric guitars. Are, are you seeing them being used in acoustic guitar as well yeah actually collings has their vintage uh, collings and martin have their authentic or vintage reproductions where they're using torrified uh bracing and top woods okay to try and get the 1930s tone right away yeah <laughs> oh that's cool 
I'm Good a big nice. fan of Torrefaction for uh, Elise electric guitar necks because mm-hmm. the wood is just not anywhere near as hygroscopic, so it doesn't screw around as much in yep. the horrible country that we live. From a repair perspective, what guitars do you find the absolute easiest to work on? Like it's this is because like I you, you say you think of yourself as like a mechanic. Um, I know mechanics who hate certain brands of guitars or cars, sorry, <laughs> because they just, they're not made to be taken apart and fixed. And then there's other brands of cars that are just like the dream to work on. Cause they're so easy to repair when they need repair. You find the same is true of guitars. Yes. Um, you don't have to name necessarily brands, no. but acoustics, you've got to at least make an acoustic or two or something. Cause acoustics it's woodwork. Yeah. You know, a neck reset is a neck reset. It's, there's no bolts. A bridge reglue is a bridge reglue. There's no bolts. Um, so I still find the more expensive guitars to be better thought out mm. and more prepared for maintenance. Uh, things like uh, Callings or a Martin where you can take the neck off without having to refinish the instrument because the neck and body are finished separately and then they're joined. Mm. So if you know your stuff and you follow proper procedure, you can take them apart, do your neck reset, and it'll look like nothing ever happened. Wow. Uh, I take, didn't know that, actually. You take something like a Gibson, which is completely assembled and then lacquered, and where the cheeks of the heel are glued to the side as well, well, it's it's work. Uh, yeah, a lot, <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah, it's still doable, but it's, it's work. And with electric guitars, it comes down to the value of the hardware. Hmm. Good hardware, very easy to work on. Bad hardware, terrible. Yeah. What are some? What are some of your favorite hardware brands? I like the Hipshot stuff. Yeah, really. Hipshot makes really nice stuff. Nice. Uh, the the higher end Floyd Rose products, so the ones that are actual metal. Yeah, the real German ones. Yeah, yeah. The, the real metal Floyd Roses. I love them. I love floating bridges. I mean, I did my apprenticeship in Montreal. It's a metal town. <laughs> so I don't even charge a price difference for doing Floyd's because they're just second nature. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you really do need that hard, hardened steel yeah. in the base plate and the studs. And yeah, because if, uh, if the knife edges aren't hardened steel, they'll go dull in no time and your Floyd rolls will never stay in tune. Same thing yeah. with the studs, same things with uh, screws for the end, everything. everything yeah. There's screws. a reason a good bridge co- of, of that type costs like $400. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And uh, like the um, the nuts on those on those uh, systems are so hard that you need uh, tungsten cutters in the mill to actually cut them. Wow! I've I tried uh, tin coated carbide that exploded. I tried diamond coated carbide that exploded. Gee. I tried just carbide that also exploded. <laughs> so when you get the little tungsten inserts, then you can start cutting them <laughs> wow. repeatedly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had I had a fun experience. I, I bought a um, uh, Wilkinson bridge that I replaced the I replaced the saddles with Graftech ghost saddles, and I wanted to I wanted it to look pretty. I didn't want freaking ghost wires hanging off the guitar. Yeah, exactly. So I I actually I, I took the took it apart and tried to drill holes through the base plate where the to run the wire through. Tough stuff. Oh my god! <laughs> I never in my life have tried. Like I broke so many bits. I was going. I was trying different speeds. I was like holding, you know, pouring machine oil onto it so it didn't overheat and destroy my bits while I was doing it. It was crazy. Yeah, it's. I mean, I know now that it's certainly a good uh, bridge, but solid stuff. Yeah, a lot of crosstalk in the ghost system, isn't there? Um, I didn't experience much. I also wasn't. I also wasn't using it for MIDI though. Okay, yeah. So I didn't run into that problem because I was, run, I, I mean, if, for, for my purposes, I was just super using it for the acoustophonic preamp to run t- an acoustic yeah. and I ran through an acoustic IR and I, you know, I could have my electric sounds and my acoustic sounds. Uh, it's like a budget Variax, I guess. But, uh, now I actually have a Variax cause they, they yeah. sound pretty good now. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're pretty cool. Yeah. It's a fun creative tool. You get instant access to a banjo. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's hook up again, and we'll do hopefully some 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 good videos on yeah. some educational stuff. I'd love that. Or just talking stuff. Just talking stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Have you ever tattooed finish? Oh, what's that? Tattooed finish. A tattooed finish. Yeah. How does that work? Oh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Until next time, then. Yeah. Thanks for coming, man. I really appreciate it. No problem. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again. And thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Until next time.